One day, a generation of members of the LGBT community will be reading about our next guest, someone who challenged the system and said long before Don't Ask, Don't Tell was history, that it should be history. Welcome to Zoe Dunning. Thank you. So, let's just start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know how you challenged the system, tell us about you getting into the Navy and saying, I'm a lesbian and I'm going to serve. Well, I entered the military um, through the Naval Academy, and both my parents had served in World War II, and so I was attracted to the Navy and to the Academy because of its, um, its values. It was about um, honor, courage, commitment. A midshipman does not lie, cheat, or steal. I found that you know, very attractive. And then shortly after I joined, I was young, and I came to the realization that I was a lesbian and that I should hide that. Mm -hmm. And it just felt wrong the entire time. It's sort of like wearing an outfit that didn't fit. Um, that you had to sort of pretend that you were something that you weren't in order to comply with the values that you cherished. So when President Clinton announced in his campaign in 1992 that he was going to lift the ban on gays serving in the military, I was like, you know, excellent, very excited. And, wh and where were you in your c career at that point when Clinton So ruled? I had served my active duty time and transitioned into the reserves, and I was at Stanford Business School. I was a second-year student down in Palo Alto at Stanford when uh, Clinton was elected. Mm -hmm. And when he had, you know, said that he was going to repeal the ban on gays in the military. And then he started to backtrack. Colin Powell got involved, Sam Nunn got involved, and it was about, I don't know, a week before his inauguration when some organizers said that they were going to have a rally at Moffett Naval Air Station basically to encourage him to do the right thing. Moffett being where Air Force One lands when it comes to California, right, just right. south Down of San in Francisco. Mountain View. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so we rallied outside the gate. Well, the rally was scheduled to be outside the gates, and the, I called the organizer just to kind of ask logistical questions like when is it going to be where is it going to be and he asked me a few questions about myself and he said you know what's your interest and I said well actually I'm an officer in the Navy Reserves and I'd like to see the ban ended I'm a lesbian myself and he said well would you like to speak and I was like oh no 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 <laughs> you know that was just too big of a, a threat it was too um, dangerous and so I politely declined um, but after I hung up uh, it just kept nagging at me and nagging at me because Throughout all of these debates, if you watch the news at that time, you know, the politicians were weighing in on it, the Pentagon was weighing in on it, civil rights activists, gay rights activists. Everyone could talk except for those who were who actually were, impacted. Yeah. So gay and lesbian service members were forced to be silent. And so I felt like their story needed to be told. I felt like I could be a representative of those who were impacted by this and speak the stories of all of those whose lives have been ruined by that policy. So I called the organizer back and I said, is that offer still available? And he said, absolutely. So somewhat spontaneously, I have to say, I didn't have any legal representation. I had no media training. I just spoke from the heart and uh, mm -hmm. spoke at this rally. And, and that's when I came out and began this journey. Yeah. How has your, it's a silly question, I mean, the leading question, but how has your life changed because of that moment? It's actually a great question because I didn't really know at the time how much it would change it. I didn't I knew it was an important decision, but I didn't think it would be the defining issue of the first year of the Clinton administration. I didn't know it was going to be on the front page of every paper. <laughs> um, and so I had to get up to speed very quickly on media and the law and, and everything else. Um, but it changed me in the sense that I, uh, a sense of really serving something that's bigger than yourself, uh, fighting for something that you felt passionately about, um, giving you the opportunity to speak on behalf of others. Um, all of these things changed for me, and I embraced it. And Ironically, um, you know, it's sort of like once I won my case, it's like, well, you better stay in now um, <laughs> because, you know, you just bought two and a half years to stay in. And we'll, I guess, get to that point. But, yeah, no, um, well, I mean, you, you, you raise an interesting question and get me right to the, the next question, which is now there are people who are serving openly as members of the LGBT community in mm -hmm. the United States Armed Forces. But you were and still are a unique case because your case was about, yes, the greater LGBT community of men and women in uniform, but it was about you. You said, right. I have a right to serve, and as I recall, the court case was def decided very narrowly, correct? Well, it was defined by a Navy administrative board. Um, we actually didn't get to federal court because mm -hmm. I won. So I was one of the very first test cases of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and no one was really quite sure, like, how do you defend this? How do you prosecute one? What are really the rules? We didn't really have any precedent. And so there was this requirement. The whole purpose of this military hearing was to rebut a presumption of conduct. They equate a statement with conduct. They say... If you say that you're gay or lesbian, we assume that you engage in gay and lesbian conduct, so we're going to throw you out for conduct. Not, we're not beating you up for who you are. We're beating right. you up for a presumed conduct. So I had to somehow legally attempt to rebut that presumption, but I didn't want to lie on the stand. 
So I, I said, look, my statement when I came out at, the, at that rally was about who I am, not about creating any presumption of what I do. And because the reason they threw you out or, or attempted to throw you out was because of your appearance at that rally. And for that one statement. For that one statement. And what's interesting is uh, I was eventually won my case and was exonerated for that. And I was eligible for prosecution if I ever made the statement again. <laughs> so in all my public appearances, all my public speeches, I always had, my lawyers are very nervous. They're like, make sure you refer back to the original statement. I always had to do this linguistic trick. Hi, I'm saying, not a lesbian, but if you want to know what I believe, go back right, to the Right, right. I'm not a lesbian, but back in 93, I came out as a lesbian and made a statement. And da 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 da, da. Yeah, it, it, the insanity just continues with the, with the issue. Yeah. I remember when Bill Clinton was running for for president. And I wonder if you had the same reaction when he said the word gay for the first time. I got kind of teary. I was like, I hadn't heard a candidate actually say that word. And then right. the night that he won from the steps of the, I believe it was the, the uh, Capitol in Little Rock, and he said, we need all of our Americans, black, white, Asian, Latino, gay. And people roared. And I remember the roar from Castro was incredible. I was in the Castro and I saw that speech on a TV in a bar in the Castro. I and did you that. think that's it. I did. I honestly believe that you know he was the man. He was going to come in on his, you know, white horse mm -hmm. and the white knight and and you know, make a difference mm -hmm. and, and be able to change it because he could have at that time. See, most people don't understand. If he chose to, he could have sent an executive order uh, because it wasn't in law at the time. He could have sent an executive order and gays could have served immediately. But he chose a different path. He chose to try to you know, get a more conciliatory environment and talk to the Pentagon and get their involvement. And that just gave them time and energy to rally the right. Christian right and everyone else that, you know, created the uproar. I re just the other night, I was at a performance in San Francisco, and just by complete luck, in front of me was sitting uh, George Schultz, former mm -hmm. Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And next to him, I guess a family friend, was Senator Nunn. Oh, oh, right. And yeah. uh, former Senator Nunn and my friend said, who is that? I said, that's one of the architects of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Did it kind of surprise you how people, even a Democratic Senator Sam Nunn from Georgia, created this thing that, from many people's point of view, made it worse than it was before? And do you think that Don't Ask, Don't Tell made it worse than it was before? I do think it made it worse in that it um, elongated the process. I think at the time... There were some well-intentioned people that thought it was giving us some space. And I think for some people, the fact that you weren't technically supposed to be um, investigated in witch hunt, because there were still witch hunts going on, and you could at least bring up charges or grievances mm -hmm. if they did. Um, but overall, it created a lot of confusion. And if you look statistically, once Don't Ask, Don't Tell was implemented, the number of discharges for homosexuality every year after that increased. Increased. Year and year and year. And then it hit a maximum right when we went to war. And then once we went to war in Afghanistan, guess what? Suddenly the discharges Gosh, you need all those gay decreased. translators. Yeah, we'll look the other way. We don't, uh, we don't care anymore. Yeah. Were you disappointed in the president? I mean, now you're not a member of the military, and so, right. you know, you can say what you think. What did you think? I was very disappointed. Um, and I think that if he had had military service himself, he might have had um, a stronger leg to stand on to do an executive order and be kind of decisive about that, but he mm -hmm. didn't. Um, and so I was disappointed, but I've, you know, I've forgiven him. I, I do think that he tried to do the best thing he could given the political mm -hmm. situation. I think it was more naivete mm -hmm. um, than, you know, um, and, and perhaps not the strong will to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just became this big firestorm his first year in office. Have you ever met President Clinton? I have not met him in person. I was in a town hall meeting of his virtually, and uh -huh. uh, back in 93 got to actually ask him a question. Um, about don't ask, don't tell, and told him that I'd been kicked out and what he was going to do about it. And what was your question and what was his response? I'm trying to remember the exact question, but uh -huh. it was after he'd already announced don't ask, don't tell, and so I expressed my, my disappointment in it and, and, and that I was a victim of it. And he kind of gave somewhat of a half-assed response of, mm -hmm. you know, well, we thought it was the best we could do. It's going to give you a zone of freedom and privacy and da 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 da, -da and, and that was that. Right. Now, you also are one of the... I believe it's 8,000 couples. I'm one of them, too. Mm -hmm. uh, one half of a couple, I should say. that got 18,000, yeah. 18,000. Yeah. They got legally married in California when uh, before there was a Prop 8. Right. Um, do you think that, did, did, did when you were fighting for the right to serve, did you ever think that the next great barrier would be same-sex marriage? Was that even on your horizon? I think same-sex marriage felt like it was a longer, a longer yeah. horizon to get to. It felt like it got very accelerated. Um, but if you look statistically at other countries that have, gotten same-sex marriage, each one of those countries got gays in the military before 
they allowed same-sex marriage in that country. So it mm -hmm. feels like it's been a natural sequence. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not surprised that, you know, as Don't Ask, Don't Tell was starting to come to a demise and the debate was happening, marriage was right behind. Mm -hmm. So how long were you in the Navy, in the Navy Reserve? Totally. 22 years. And do you ever miss it? I do. I do at times. I mean, there's a certain camaraderie that you get from that common mission. Um, that it's, it's hard to replicate anywhere else. Um, you certainly get some unique experiences. You know, I got to go out on a Zodiac in the, you know, Persian Gulf uh, out of Doha, Qatar, mm -hmm. and drop on a buoys. Um, you know, not everyone gets that experience. Uh -huh. And you are given the opportunity to interact with and see people that you don't normally necessarily would interact with in a, you know, like a white-collar office job or, you know, um, your, your normal sort of bubble that we surround ourselves with, with people who are like ourselves. I mean, the military, you've got a postman next to a banker, next to a... Um, it's the great dem uh, democratic experiment. It is, and people from all over the country with all sorts of experiences. So I do miss that quite a bit, and that sense of um, serving a, a greater purpose. You know, I do change management consulting f for a living for my private sector job, and it's interesting, and I like the people I do it with, but I don't feel like I'm really changing the world by helping a company implement their IT system more effectively. Right. Now, your, your current job is change management consultant. So if you had to go, if you, could, if you could go back in time, 16, 18 years, whatever it was, and help the military do the change from prohibiting uh, openly gay or lesbian members of the military to serving to helping them serve, what would be some of your advice as a consultant? How would you manage that change? And do well, you think they did it well? It's interesting because uh, I'm not sure that they were, were set up for success back, you know, 18 years ago, but I look at what Obama did, and I was as impatient as anyone. I was like, you know, look, just do it. forget trying to get the Pentagon's buy-in, you know, forget, forget all of these steps in Congress and all of this, just do it. Um, because I saw people's lives getting affected every day. I mean, we were kicking out two to three service members a day. Um, and so every day that we lost before we could repeal it, I felt like was, you know, frustrating. But if you do look at it from a change management model, which is about how do we um, get sponsorship for the change? Who do we get that can give us kind of air cover for it? Well, mm -hmm. he had to get air cover from Gates and Mullen mm -hmm. in order to get the Pentagon to adopt it. He had to get air cover from Congress. Um, we had to get a a Democrat and um, Joe or, Lieberman mm -hmm. to sponsor the bill. You can just do it as a Democratic thing. Um, you look at it in terms of stakeholder engagement, the survey that he did of the troops. Um, you look at it in terms of communications and the training that they did to prepare the troops for it. It's a classic change management um, study, and I think Obama actually did it how a change management professional would suggest that it get done. Two presidents later. We're speaking with Zoe Dunning. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll be back, and we'll talk about going from the U.S. Navy to stand-up comic stages. We'll be right back. And we're back with 10%. I'm your host, David Perry, and we're speaking with Zoe Dunning, retired naval commander. And, you know, now you've gone from the deck of a ship to the boards of a theater stage. Is there anything funny about being a former Navy commander, open lesbian person who helped change the rules of engagement, as it were? <laughs> well, I, um, when I have done stand-up comedy, some material has come from my experience um, by, by coming out. Um, one in particular that comes to mind is the March on Washington in 1993. They had assembled a, a whole group of us activists on gays in the military to go up on stage and be recognized. And we were right after RuPaul. <laughs> and so we're... I see, yeah, sorry. So it's, you know, um, we're backstage. It was a warm day. Sybil Shepard had her little, you know, parasol to keep her out of the sun. And Martina Navratilova was there and Melissa Etheridge with um, her partner at the time. And then there was a lineup of, you know, former and current military who were fighting. So there was Greta Kammermeyer and Joe Stefan and Justin Elzey and Michelle mm -hmm. Beneke and a number of us. And we were just sort of waiting our turn. The schedule, like most gay events, was woefully Way behind, over, woefully behind yeah. schedule. And uh, mm. RuPaul gets on and starts, you know, singing her hit at the time and it'll work. And, and we just all sort of break <laughs> out into dance, and, you know, behind the stage. And we're, like, you know, bored and also, you know, celebratory to be there. And we started a kick line. And so there I am in a kick line with Greta Kammermeyer to my left and, um, you know, another guy to my right. And we look across, and there's Barney Frank screaming, red-faced. U.S. Running congressman, a, yeah. U.S. congressman, Barney Frank, gay, running across the field, screaming at us to stop. Screaming, screaming, screaming at us to stop. We're like, 
what? Why? And he was like, that's just what the Christian right would like to catch on camera and, you know, and, and to use against us. He was like, you know, don't do that. They'll use it against us. We were like, well, what do we do? And he's like, dance boy girl. So, <laughs> so here we are, you know, the March on Washington for gay rights. And, you know, we're backstage dancing boy girl um, just so that the Christian right doesn't catch us on tape because Barney Frank, our elected gay congressman, told us not to. Well, shame on Barney. <laughs> well, it was you know. a little awkward at the time. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, those, I mean, we've all been probably to more marches on Washington than we can count. And they all seem to have this odd mixture of seriousness and, and comedy. Well, there's seriousness and comedy. And there's also, I think, all of us struggle with being completely yourself and also knowing that anytime anyone looks at you, they think, you know, like you are what represents your community, mm -hmm. right? So there's that sort of um, representational aspect to it. So you want to have fun, but it's like, oh, if someone catches this on camera, how will that reflect poorly on the community? And that's been kind of one of the struggles. I've Not struggles, but challenges of being a public figure on this issue for the last 18 years mm -hmm. is I always do have to be cognizant of right. everything that I say and do, how might that reflect on the issue or on the community? Well, and of course, now you're going to be going even more into the public eye because there's a run for office here, correct? There is. There is. Um, since I've retired and since Don't Ask, Don't Tell has been repealed, um, I'm kind of looking for the next big thing where I want to try to make a difference um, that I want to work on something bigger than myself. And so I'm entering into local politics, which a lot of people are like, why would you want to do that in San Francisco? It's, you know, crazy. Yeah, making. I don't know what's, uh, what's scarier, armed conflict or politics. Well, in that's the Bay what Area. I say. I say, I you mean, know, now. I took on the Pentagon. I'm 22 years in the Navy. I should be able to handle San Francisco politics. I don't know, which is tougher. That's, that's hard. It's, it's a blood sport. <laughs> um, so I am running for the Democratic County Central Committee. Um, right. so looking for, uh, any, registered Democrat in the eastern half of the city to yeah, yeah, yeah. vote on June 5th. Uh, Do you think you'd have done that if you hadn't gone what you went through with Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the Pentagon and I all don't that? think so. I think um, going through the Don't Ask, Don't Tell process, I learned so much about uh, legislative process, about um, you know en engaging constituents, um, trying to put together a media savvy uh, effort to try to influence decision makers. And I think part of this came about of, you know, all this effort to influence decision makers, to lobby them, to provide them information. It's like, you know, I, w I want to be a decision you maker. You want to be that person. And um, there's a great saying. There's a, a les openly lesbian uh, senator from the state of Missouri, uh, State Senator Jolie Justice, and she has this great saying uh, that says, uh, if, you don't, um, if you don't have a seat at the table, so how does it go? Hold on. If you don't have a seat on the tab at the table, you're probably on the menu. <laughs> and, I, and I feel it's true. I feel like, you know, you, you have to be there, be part of the conversation to represent whatever, yeah. you know, your, your values and issues are. When you were in the Navy and on the menu as someone who was probably hiding and not wanting to be on the menu, did you ever come across real overt homophobia? And did you come across real overt sexism? And which was worse? And are they separate? They're intermingled, I think. Um, in my experience, being a woman in the military was actually more difficult than being gay or lesbian. Gay yeah. or lesbian, being lesbian, uh -huh. um, just because you were so visible and there, and people didn't necessarily know that I was lesbian, but they knew that I was a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, I w went through the Naval Academy in one of the very early classes in the early '80s, and so we were still very new and still very much not wanted there. So I probably faced not wanted more. by whom? The other, the other. Uh, um Cadets or the other midshipmen and the leadership, they felt like we were in some sense um, poisoning the institution. Mm -hmm. um, that somehow we were changing the definition of what it man meant to be a, a warrior and a, and, a, and a sailor and um, you know a naval officer. And at that time, the academy was mission was to develop line officers for combat, and they limited women so much from combat that a lot of women at that time had to graduate and go on to, um, you know, more support roles or, or backup jobs. roles or desk jobs. And so they resented, not that it was our fault, yeah. but they resented us for the fact that we were taking the place of a man who could have gone to combat. Right. What was the hardest part of your naval training? Um, Physically or emotionally? I think um, plebe year at the Naval Academy was really tough in many ways. It tested me. I don't think I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, I was 17 years old. Did you ever go back had, to your mom and dad and say, well, oh, what have I done? Um, I did, but what it kept going true in my mind is they always said, you know, only one out of, I think, at that time, 11 or 12 applicants actually get in. So I kept thinking of those 10 people who didn't get in and I was taking their place. And so mm -hmm. that always inspired me to push further and work harder because I didn't want to let down the folks who 
really, really wanted that spot and didn't get it. Um, it was also tough for me emotionally because um, the last time I saw my mother alive, I knew that she had terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And so when I got on that plane for Annapolis um, was the last time I, I saw her. And she did pass away four weeks into my academic year. Um, mm -hmm. So just kind of combining that with the academic rigors, with the physical, uh, you know, and the emotional aspects. And then I realized a couple months later that I pretty sure that I'm a lesbian and that I can mm -hmm. get kicked out for that. So my grades weren't the best my first two years yeah. at the academy, let's just say. And then I got a wake-up call and they said, you better start studying. And I, I did, and I, I did very well mm -hmm. my last two years. But uh, it, was, it was a tough couple of years. And so now, after all the struggles of going through Don't Ask, Don't Tell and your personal story, mm -hmm. do you get emails, correspondence, phone calls from you know, other young lesbians in the Navy or in the military saying, you know, now we can legally serve, but this is what the issues are like now? Well, there's a new organization out there that I'm very excited about. It's called OutServe, and it's almost like an employee resource group for actively serving military folks. And I've been involved with the formation of it. I've advised the founders, Ty Walrod, who's here in San Francisco, and Josh Seafried, um, about how to form it. It's over 4,000 strong now of actively serving LGBT service members. And mm -hmm. they had a conference in Las Vegas last October that I attended. And so it's fun to sort of pass the torch to the next generation and give advice and, and help them because there are still issues that we have to face. Even though we have, um, you know, open service with Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we still don't have open service for transgender. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have... Um, same-sex partner benefits, uh, survivor benefits, health care, base housing, all of these things that are heterosexual counterparts. Just get. Get. Um, whether they're, they could be, you know, they've known each other for two months and gotten mm -hmm. pregnant and, you know, got married as a result and, and suddenly that person's Automatic. eligible for base housing, whereas a same-sex mm -hmm. part, you know, partnership where they've been together for 20 years do not get those benefits. Right. You mentioned something that I imagine even when Don't Ask, Don't Tell first came up wasn't in the minds of Bill Clinton or the Secretary of Defense, openly transgender members of the military. Has that become more and more of an issue, or is it an issue just that was always there and now, wow, we've got to deal with it? It's becoming, uh, through Service Members Legal Defense Network, which mm -hmm. is the organization I've been affiliated with for much of the last 18 years, uh, more and more of the calls that we're getting in are from transgender service members about um, transitioning, whether they can transition. The groundwork really hasn't been laid from an education standpoint to quite push for it right here, right now. we got to mm -hmm. lay a bit of foundation, but there have been other militaries, foreign militaries, that have opened up their service. It's a complex issue around, you know, exactly how they define transgender service and whether that's cross-dressing, whether that's mm -hmm. pre-op, post-op, you know, what, how they're going right. to handle that. Right. In our last few moments, some advice for a member of the military who's now serving as an open lesbian, how to handle it. I like to say just be yourself and be professional and um, you know you are representing thousands so you need to you know present yourself well but just you know enjoy it be yourself and, and, and do and your serve. job and serve. Thank you so much we've been speaking with Zoe Dunning I'm David Perry thanks for watching we'll see you next week on 10%.